our new colleague, uh, Christian Carmelo del Castillo. Uh, Christian grew up in the Philippines where he obtained uh, his first master in 2000, and then he decided to move in Japan where at the University of Kigoshima, where he obtained successfully a second master in 2003 and a PhD in 2008, working on fisheries and uh, microbiology. Then he continued his uh, young career in Korea, where he worked as a research scientist. And now he joined SOMAS and MADL uh, to work as a postdoc uh, associate. So Chris is very interested in uh, general fisheries, apply microbiology and actually on uh, marine animal health in general. So I think today we're going to learn a little bit more about his research, uh, some catastrophic scenario I think, since he's going to talk to us about <laughs> horizontal transfer of antibiotic resistance between fish and human pathogen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Manuel. Um, <coughs> And I want to thank all of you for coming here today, despite the, uh, the terrible weather outside. And uh, when, I, when I saw the snow and the dark and the gloom outside, I decided to uh, start the, the presentation with something a little more lighter. Uh, Emmanuel uh, described uh, my, my history, but I just want to also introduce you again with, the, with pictures. And so as um, Emmanuel stated, I was born in the Philippines and, uh, and in an island called Negros. And uh, as, as um, some of you may imagine, the Philippines is uh, filled with uh, white sand beaches. And uh, the coldest temperature we get is so uh, in Celsius, 24 degrees. <laughs> and people would think that's already cold. Yeah. So this kind of weather, nobody could imagine. <laughs> And uh, the, the island was is uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a bit rural, and uh, the, the biggest industry is the sugar cane. And uh, after living here in in Bacolod, I transferred to to Miangao, which is in the it's just an island across. If you look, uh, I was in this island, and then I just jumped to another island. And here I I. We studied uh, aquaculture. This, uh, these two islands at the time uh, were were very big with uh, with shrimp aquaculture, Pineas monodon. And uh, after some time, because of too much uh, stocking of shrimps in higher too much densities, the industry collapsed because of uh, vibrio disease. So that got uh, started to the track of. Uh, animal diseases. And then, after uh, spending some years here, I transferred to Japan. And uh, if you know Japan, if, if ever you know Japan, it's composed of three or uh, four main islands. And I lived all, all, my all my time there in only the southernmost island, in four places in that southernmost island. Uh, in this part, in the north part, it's called Karatsu City. and. Uh, it's uh, famous for this uh, forest of uh, pine, which they uh, used to, to plant to protect the city from, from the winds. And uh, this is the, the area where uh, in 1500s, or, or uh, oh, earlier, uh, 12, 80 or something, the Mongols tried to invade uh, Japan. And uh, here they had their ships around this area, and then the, uh, a typhoon came and drowned all those Mongols. And that's what the Japanese called the original Kamikaze, God, uh, Wind of the Gods. <laughs> and then, of course, later it became into something else. And then uh, this part I also lived here, this is called Kumamoto. and. Uh, as you can see, there's this huge castle there. It's, it's, uh, there are many castles still in Japan, and this I think this is one of the most beautiful castles that I've ever seen. Because the, uh, the, the uh, towers and all that, it's still original. Most of the other castles, 
it looks great from outside, but when you go in, it's just a concrete museum. It's nothing to look at from inside. But this one, it's still wood and all that thing. It's very low, interestingly. If you, uh, even from my height, if I tried to walk, I would hit my head on the beams. I think they did that on purpose. And also another interesting thing is uh, the, the floor is very noisy. That is also done on purpose. So that if there are, you know, you've heard of ninjas, right? And, well, they, they're real. <laughs> if the ninjas would you know, try to infiltrate the castle, they step on the floor, it will squeak, and everyone will know. And, the, and also the outside, the gravel, gravel? Gravel is uh, also very noisy, and then if someone walks or runs, it's difficult to walk and, and noisy. So it's very difficult to, to just infiltrate it. And then after that, I lived in uh, the southernmost part. In, uh, this one is called Kagoshima. The interesting thing about Kagoshima, there's a volcano there that erupts uh, about 200 times in a year. So you always see it like that. Maybe only in my old time there, I only saw it twice or thrice without the plume of ash. Luckily, when I was there, uh, this ash usually fell to the other side. Just when I was about to leave, it started falling in the city again. And people usually, you see a lot of people wearing masks and uh, dark glasses, not because of the, uh, the sun, the glare of the sun, but to protect the eyes from all the ash. And uh, it's one of the most active volcanoes in the world. And another interesting uh, thing about that place, it's, uh, it's the home of this guy. His name is Saigo Takamori. And he's the, the real last samurai. Okay? He doesn't look like anything like Watanabe can. Okay? <laughs> he's more homely. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Tom Cruise maybe never came there. And then, uh, and I also lived in another part, which is uh, called uh, Kirishima City, and. Uh, there it's, it's famous for it's a very beautiful uh, temple. Then after that, I went to Korea, as uh, Emmanuel mentioned, in a city called Jinju. Uh, this city is, uh, if, uh, this is the famous cities of Korea, is uh, here in Seoul and here in Busan. And this one is uh, just a bit to the west of Busan. It's a very small city. Um, it's famous for uh, two things, uh, three things. One is this uh, fortress. Okay. This fortress is, again, famous for uh, uh, a Japanese invasion. The Japanese invaded Korea, and uh, they almost started to take the whole country, but they were stopped here because of, the, of this fortress. And this festival, called the Lantern Festival, is a celebration of that, of uh, the, uh, the holding out, and then they sent messages through the river, through lamps. And then they're also famous for this bullfighting. Now, in Spanish bullfighting, it's man against bull. In here, it's bull against bull. I've never seen it, and I really don't want to see it. Just heard of it. <laughs> I don't really like the you know, animal cruelty and all that. Now, enough for the introduction, and let's get down to business. Okay. My topic is on the uh, horizontal transfer of antibiotic resistance between fish and human pathogens. Okay, uh, in, uh, in sooner or later, the details will come out. But one very interesting uh, part of this topic is a news that came out last year. Okay. Last year, there was this big news about this uh, girl in, in Georgia, I think, that had flesh-eating bacteria. Okay. She was... Uh, bathing in a lake, I think, and she caught her calf, and then later the, the, the wound is separated, and uh, she ended up having to have her leg cut off, another foot cut off, two hands cut off. It was a terrible thing. And uh, after that, uh, several other reports of such flesh-eating bacteria came out. It seems that maybe about uh, 10 or 20,000 cases of this happen every year in the US. And uh, about one-fifth of that 
cause it in the uh, mortality of, of the person that was involved. Now, there are, uh, this disease is more sensitive uh, known necrotizing fasciitis, and there are several causative agents. One of this is Pheromonas hydrophila, which is normally a fish pathogen. And uh, in the case of this uh, Georgia woman, uh, Amy, Miss Amy Copeland, it was this Aeromonas hydrophila, a multidrug resistant strain of Aeromonas hydrophila that caused her uh, this disease. Yeah. Aeromonas hydrophila, uh, is, as I mentioned, is ubiquitous to most aquatic environments. It would be everywhere. Most of them uh, are not drug resistant, or at least not multi-drug resistant. This, uh, this bacterium has been implicated in fish, amphibians, and, uh, and recently, more recently, in human diseases. It is known to be zoonotic. And uh, a strain, a multi-drug resistant strain, was recently isolated from a tilapia farm in Thailand. Now, the plasmid mediated drug resistance in this bacterium has been reported ever since 1970, when my, uh, my former uh, PI uh, reported this uh, RA1 plasmid. Now, what plasmid and what uh, most drug resistance, I will explain it in a little bit later. But for now, there are some reported strains, uh, uh, plasmid strains. One is RA1. Another is BJA 5017 RA3, and the newer one that I that I'm going to be discussing in detail, PR148. If you look at the uh, the incompatibility group, now the, the INC group or incompatibility group means that uh, a plasmid and a plasmid cannot coexist together. Okay, so you, you can uh, uh, group them in a what's more like a uh, Phenotypic grouping. So the grouping of of the new plasmid discovered is is slightly different from the other groups, and the drug resistance markers, the phenotypic drug resistance markers, it's just resistant to about five antibiotics. And also the isolation was from a different animal. Most of the other plasmids were isolated from eels. This one was from tilapia. And also the <coughs> the locale was different. Now, let's try to uh, explain what drug resistance is. Simply speaking, it's just a condition wherein a disease-causing organism is resistant to you know to a variety of drugs that were made to kill it. Basically, it can't be killed by that drug. And there are many degrees. This uh, degrees of drug resistance have recently been uh, uh, the CDC and the European, another uh, European Committee have, have decided to, to to make the standardized de uh, description. There's some multi-drug resistant, which is uh, among this antibiotics. It should be un not not susceptible. It cannot be killed by about three of these categories that would be considered as multi-drug resistant. Then there is extremely drug resistant, which among all these antibiotics, it cannot be killed by all but two. And then there is the very scary drug resistant GM bacteria, so it would be the pan drug resistant, which cannot be killed by any of these antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, show you in more detail, this one are the antimicrobial categories, and then this species, is it back? And the species, uh, can someone, the laser pointer? Is it really? Yeah, it's not working anymore. So, oh. <laughs> so there are some species that are intrinsically resistant to these antimicrobial agents. Like there, there are some 
like the Mycobacteria, Providentia, or Citrobacter. Some of these are without the presence of other uh, plasmids or, or other drug resistance genes. It's already intrinsically drug resistant. In its, in it's uh, genotypically, chromosomally resistant. <coughs> now, how is this drug resistant disseminated? Uh, horizontal gene transfer can be differentiated from vertical gene transfer simply with it. Vertical gene transfer is the uh, transfer of a gene from a, from a parent to an offspring. Okay? It's the most common thing happening in, in mammals, for example. But horizontal gene transfer is different from that. It's, think of it like uh, you and me. I have a, some sort of a resistance against a certain disease, and I suddenly transfer it to you. It's basically like that. It doesn't happen mostly in, uh, in higher organisms, but in eukaryotes, it happens a lot. It is the primary reason for this antibiotic resistance and the spread of antibiotic resistance. It's also a, a very important in the in the bacteria that can degrade the uh, noble compounds, so it can also be useful. And also, it's a very important in the transmission of viral. Sometimes the question is like, as one bacteria, another bacteria, one causes disease, one doesn't. What's what's the uh, what's the difference between them? Sometimes it is the the acquisition of a plasmid of a viral plasmid, and this is usually involving the temperate bacteriophages or plasmids. Now, this uh, this is a short description of temperate bacteriophage. It's a uh, the bacteriophage that doesn't kill its host. Okay, there are two kinds of phages. One is the uh, lytic and the other is temperate. The lytic bacteriophage will enter the host and kill it. Uh, the temperate bacteriophage will enter the host and, some, and uh, would, would uh, trick the host into adding its genome into the, into the host. This uh, mechanisms of gene exchange, there are basically three mechanisms. Transformation, which uh, it is the alteration of, uh, of, a, of a, a genome or a genetic structure by the transferring of, of, a, of a sequences. This is usually uh, used in the laboratory also to create uh, transformation transformed bacteria for experimental purposes. Then there's bacterial conjugation. Uh, <clears throat> what happens during bacterial conjugation is uh, the, a bacteria and another bacteria, they're going to exchange genetic material. This is usually in the form of plasmids. Now, how this exchange happens is more often than not is the plasmid that causes the, the exchange to happen, not the bacteria. The plasmid themselves, they contain genes that will uh, trick or order the bacteria to transfer them and thus disseminate. And then there's the transduction, which is the uh, transfer of genetic material uh, through uh, viruses, bacteriophages. So how this multi-drug Resistant happen. So think of one bacteria, okay, like the further one in the, in the left. For example, this is a gene that, uh, that's, that protected against ampicillin, one antibiotic. Then by conjugation, it's going to transfer to another bacteria. Let's say this bacteria has another plasma. Which is of a different incompatibility groups, so they can exist together. And in the genome of that bacteria, there's another gene that encodes for another antibiotic resistance. Let's say tetracycline, and this one for sulfamethoxazole. Okay. 
And then by the transformation, this can happen. Only one plasmid that contains all these three antibiotic resistance genes. So this transfers again, receives more. Antibiotic resistance genes transfers again, receives more, it goes on and on. And it's very possible that only one plasmid can contain all antibiotic resistance genes. Unfortunately, it has not yet been shown to be the case, but that is not an impossible thing. So what is the danger of this multi-drug resistance? Okay. First of all, <coughs> um, luckily right now, most, of the, uh, most people <coughs> recognize the danger of indiscriminate antibiotic use, okay, especially I think in the US. But unfortunately, not all parts of the world are like that. Okay. In, I remember when I was in Japan, I got a cold, I still got prescribed antibiotics. Even when I told the doctor that what's it gonna do? Okay. And I'm sure that's the same thing in other countries. And from what I know, the Philippines is the same, India is the same, I don't know, maybe China, Korea, Korea wasn't. So, that's only in humans. In agriculture, antibiotics are given as a fattening agent. Not just as also a protection against disease, of course, but also as a fattening agent. The same thing in aquaculture. So, from this, this antibacterial resistant genes, what, what will happen is you put a bacteria into a system yeah, and then you put the antibiotic. Okay. The antibiotic will kill all the bacteria that's not resistant to it. What will be left? Resistant bacteria. And this resistant bacteria will grow and fill up this whole system. And this resistant bacteria will be the dominant microflora, and they will disseminate, they will exchange their drug resistance genes, and then this goes on and on and on. And then sooner or later, there will be bacteria that cannot be killed by any antibiotics that we have anymore. Now, I will go into more detail into this <coughs> plasma that we isolated from Aeromonas hydrophila. First, I will describe in detail the uh, characteristics of, of this plasmid. Okay, we, uh, we sequenced the, the plasmid using uh, 454 sequencing, just a little bit older technology. And then uh, the plasmid looks a bit like this. This is the backbone of the plasmid. And from here to here is an accessory region encoding for several antibiotic resistance genes. And here, and partly here, is a uh, type 4 secretion system, which is the, uh, the genes that uh, creates a pilus that's going to cause the, the conjugation, and then, uh, and then exchange this plasma to another bacteria. Using a, a blast, uh, uh, using a, a more relaxed uh, parameters than what's um, normally found in, in by default. We were able to find several uh, sequences, several other known plasmids that are very similar to this plasmid that we have. We, uh, this one only shows the, about uh, those uh, results that are higher than 50% similarity. So we wanted to see in more detail the, the differences among these plasmids. Okay. Of course, looking at it in all of these plasmids is a very hard work. So we just decided on four plasmids. Why we decided on this? First, this one is the most closely related. It's almost the same, except for the uh, this region, which is the accessory region, which is normally is it, easily uh, very uh, mutable. This other plasmid is very similar to this and this, 
except for here, for this region. And of course, again, the accessory region. And then this plasmid, this is a, it's a well-known and old plasmid, and then it's almost similar except for here and here also. So we just decided to focus on this four plasmids to look at them in detail. We used uh, a software program called MAO. Uh, this program is going to uh, look for similar regions in in those uh, sequences that we feed it. And then we'll show regions that are similar by uh, a MAV color. That's why it's called MAV. There's, there's a, a more longer meaning for that, but it, this color means that these regions are similar in all sequences that we tested. This uh, other colors means that it's similar only to some of the sequences. Like here is only here, here is only here. And so, Looking into detail again, in these four sequences, we will focus on the at first on this part. We call this the, in, in, uh, the first indel region. Indel, in case you don't know, is the insertion deletion region. A place where uh, there's an insertion or a deletion. But sometimes you don't know if it's, if it's inserted or deleted. You don't know which is the original sequence. So, Looking at this first indel, <coughs> the first three sequences <coughs> are very similar. But the fourth one is missing this region. In its stead, there is an antibacterial resistant insert. This one is uh, for, for chlorphenicol, tetracycline, and uh, streptomycin. This one, this AAA family interface, is uh, is and the Barbe partition protein is uh, important for, of course, for uh, for some processes, but obviously it's not essential. In the second region, here, this is the region where you can find the type for secretion system, the genes that cause the bacteria to, to transfer to another bacteria. <clears throat> and here, our sequence is the simplest. The other sequences have, again, an antibacterial insert. And the very similar this is a beta lactamase. This is also beta lactamase. And here, the lowest one, the PSN254, if you look at it, it's just a repeat. You copy this, flip it over, basically the same. It's just a, a duplicate, but in the different orientation. In this region, the third indel region, you can see from here that all the others look similar except for these four sequences. <coughs> that sequence, this, uh, these others are the similar sequences. They all have this uh, DNA methylase DCM, while that sequence that had the gap is simply missing this. And then for the fourth indel, this is very different. And of course, we expect it to be. This is the uh, area where most of the accessory regions can be found. Now, for these three sequences, I didn't even bother to include the accessory region. I wanted only to see the differences in the backbone. For these two sequences, there's this HSR family deoxyribonuclease, which can also be found here, but not in here or here. 
between the first and the fourth. And interestingly, this RHS uh, family protein, it's the meaning is retrotransposome hotspot region, and supposedly it's a it's a place where transposomes are, are can easily insert. Interestingly, not much com even compared to the other streams, to the other sequences, not much transposome insertion is happening there. It's more happening here in this region. Another interesting differences, the first and the fourth sequence has this mercuric resistance operon, the, uh, the purple, the, the pink one. Well, the second and third doesn't have that. And this is a, a very important part of the sequence. This is the accessory region, and, uh, and this accessory region of, of PR148, of, this, of the Aeromonas sideropila plasmid, First of all, it contains a TN21 transposome. It's not, it's not the typical type, but it's still uh, the, the presence of the mercuric resistance operon and the class one integral, the five prime end. This is, this is a classical TN21 transposome. And the, the class one integron also isn't also uh, very common. This is not the common type. This one, Contains a uh, beta lactonase offset 10 and, and uh, the other one is A, the A1. These two genes are almost 100% similar to, to the same genes from Acinetobacter, Baumani, which is uh, again a human, human pathogen. And this part is very similar to. Uh, different incompatibility group plasmids. This plasmids PRA3 and PAR32 are aeromonas plasmid. But only this one, only this region is similar. The rest of the backbone is very different. And these are usually uh, were found from fish. The other parts are unique. This is also a, a unique TN1721 transposome. And we also tested for the mercuric resistance operon if it's, uh, if it's working or not. It doesn't seem to be. There, there was no mercuric resistance. <clears throat> so just to, to show in, uh, in only one figure the, all of these differences, the innermost uh, uh, sequence this is our plasma, the PR148. And then this is regions of similarity to uh, PN, PNM, NDM1.1. This is similar to PNDM12237. This is similar to PSM254. And then these are the inserts that are different. So basically, the important thing there is to notice that this and this plasmid are very, very similar to each other. These are the, all of those plasmids uh, that are, have higher than 50% similarity and the differences in those indel regions. This insert of uh, antibiotic resistance is very commonly found, while the one in our Aeromonas hydrophila with the AAA antipase is commonly found only in this group, in this E. coli. And this insert of the uh, beta lactam in CFY is also very commonly found. Here and here, it's only the T type for secretion system. Now, <clears throat> we have been showing visually the similarity of those uh, sequences. But an important thing is to quantify the similarity. So we were just, uh, thinking, how do we? quantify the similarity. Because, uh, okay, it looks similar. If, if you notice, this looks similar to this. But also partly this is similar to this. So how do you quantify the similarity? The most common uh, way of doing this is to look for 
genes, or CDS is a more uh, proper term for them. If you look for genes that are similar in all the sequences, then concatenate them, mix them together, and then uh, test for similarity using uh, like a classical doubling. This is the uh, most commonly used uh, technique. But the question here is, for example, in this, in this sequences, here, A, B is similar to all three sequences. D is also similar to all three sequences. So you only choose A, B, and D, and you mix all of them together. You uh, basically just cut and paste them. But in this case, a, B, okay, are similar to all three sequences. D is not. E isn't either. So if using this technique, you will disregard the relationship that can, you can get from D and E. So it's not the most optimal way of doing it. It's optimal up to a certain degree. Another way of, of looking at this uh, similarity of trying to uh, quantify the similarity is to visualize it in a, in a network. Okay. For example, <clears throat> uh, first you try to uh, test this genes. Okay. So is there a gene similar to this in another sequence? Okay. This is a one plasmid, one plasmid, another plasmid. Is there a gene similar to this in another sequence? If there is, then you accept. Okay. It's there, it's present. And then you try to count the number of genes that are similar. Okay. Here to here, there are how many similar? Three. Okay. One to two. A is similar, B is similar, D is similar. Okay. One to three. A is similar, B is similar, E is similar. And only two. Okay. Two to three. A is similar, B is similar, E is similar, three. Okay? So you can show them as a network that this one is less closely related than this to this. Okay? And then we introduce a cutoff score and, accept and cutoff acceptance value. Here, one to four, there's, there's only one similar. Okay? We don't accept it. Two to four, there's only, uh, there's no similar, so it's not accepted. Three to four, there's nothing, there's no similar genes, so it's not accepted. It's out of the network. This is a, uh, also a good way of uh, trying to cut the relationships. But one of the problems is, look at this. They don't look similar, right? But if Using this method, this will be considered as exactly 100% similar. Because the ordering is not taken into consideration. It's only the presence or absence of these genes. However, we tried this, uh, this uh, similarity. We tried this test to the uh, similarity network. Okay, our, our our plasmid, PR148, and we tested it for similarity against uh, a database okay, of uh, several plasmids. Unfortunately, this database isn't really up to date, so it's um, about all the plasmids that were discovered up to 2008, I think, or 2009. So anyway, we were able to get several plasmids that are very similar to our plasmid. Up to here, it's still very highly similar. And up to here, the similarity starts to decrease. To show this in a network of all those known MGEs, all those mobile genetic elements, this PR148 can be found here. It's a huge group of MGEs that are very, very similar to each other. So what's the implication of this? First, this group of sequences have been being, are being passed back and forth between each other in bacteria, in transposons, in plastids. And then it's being transferred again and transferred again and transferred again. 
and it's changed a bit, but mostly it's similar. All of these are similar. They just change a little bit every time they're being transferred. And to show the similarity of this plasmid to to other plasmids, <coughs> this is a, a detailed view. The letter B is a detailed view of what of what can be found inside there. That's a small division from there. And so, <coughs> however, we were not satisfied with this uh, method of uh, of quantification. First, because the uh, first of all, the database was a little bit old. It doesn't show the newer <coughs> plasmids, which are coming every month, actually. Uh, when, I, I sh when I did the last homology search, a couple of months later, I did another last homology search that's just to uh, clarify again if the, the situation is the same. There were several new plasmids that came out, and I didn't have time to do that again and again and again just to keep up to date. So maybe if I do that blast search right now, I would come up again with several new plasmids. So I we tried to do a Plasto W, uh, just a simple Plasto W uh, analysis, similarity analysis on the backbone of this plasma. The, we, we, we simply had to change the parameters of it because the plus L W is, uh, if there's a gap in between it, it will not accept that as similar anymore. So we, we allowed that this plus L W will recognize gaps of several hundreds of base pairs. Okay. So from that result, our plasmid from fish, okay, from Thailand, is still very similar to this plasmid. The E. coli PNDM1 top 1. It's still a very, very similar. Now, <clears throat> this four plasmids were all found in this region, and they're all human pathogens. This, uh, this one was uh, actually, it's actually from a Japanese man who came from India, okay? and uh, he was sick for a month. Of, of, uh, of, of this of this bacteria and they couldn't heal them. These other plasmids also were were isolated from hospitals in India and Pakistan. <coughs> this plasmid was uh, isolated from a, from from the US actually from a soldier who served in Afghanistan. This plasmid from Kenya this plasmid from another human. And then this one, it seems to move if you look at it. If you look at the similarity. From here, it seems to move geographically. And then here, the plasmids in the US, which were isolated from, from pigs, cattle, turkey, <coughs> they're very similar to each other. This one was isolated from a fish, but it's most closely related to plasmids which are isolated from humans, not to other fish. Okay. Even the other uh, similar, uh, similar group of, uh, of bacteria, the closest uh, Aeromonas hydrophila plasmid is here, it's very different. And the other fish uh, plasmids are here, it's, it's slightly different. So we could say that there, this plasmids and this plasmids have been transferred to each other more than a fish plasmid to another fish plasmid. So this chance of this happening, a plasmid from a human pathogen to a fish pathogen, is higher in this condition. This is also very uh, interesting. These plasmids are very similar to Yersinia, Yersinia pistis orientalis plasmid, PT1202. Uh, now, why is this interesting? Yeah. Yersinia pistis is the causative agent of the plague, also known as you know, the Black Death. 
which threatened to annihilate all of humanity several times in the past. So now it's not uh, very dangerous because it can be controlled by antibiotics. But there are plague bacteria that can be killed by antibiotics. If this gets out of hand, if this gets more antibiotic resistance, we could look again at possible end of the human race. Now, so this exchange is happening. Okay, in this case, it's just happening between another human pathogen and a human pathogen. That's, that's commonly accepted. You have a bacteria in your stomach, another bacteria comes in, they exchange. But this one, fish pathogen, the human pathogen, how does this happen? One possibility is, of course, just that there's, uh, in between them, there's the uh, transfer, they, they get mixed in the water. Okay. You get, you don't know, in, in Thailand, in India, maybe the, the water source isn't very clean, and this, and this starts to transfer one to another. But the important thing now is, In discriminate use of antibiotics in animal culture is a danger not only to the animals, it's a danger also to us. Okay. So from what I know, it's still being used in the US in animal culture. Korea has already stopped it. They just decided a couple of years ago, or just last year, I think a couple of years ago, to not use antibiotics in cattle or in, in bovine culture. And in Japan also, it's, uh, they're, they're moving to stop antibiotic use in fish. But the, maybe, maybe the US should also try to move for something like that. Now this is the uh, end of the, of the first part okay, of my talk. And then the second part is a bit more shorter. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, the first part was flesh-eating bacteria. <laughs> this one is glowing bacteria. Okay. This is a Photobacterium damsele fishicida, which was previously known as Pasteurella fishicida. It is uh, mostly involved in fish disease. Okay. Later, uh, I will show a connection between the first part and the second part, but for now it's just a, uh, uh, another plasmid that was isolated in, in this photobacterium. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the, the plasmid. It's very different from the first one. Okay. Uh, first of all, the uh, transfer, the uh, excretion system regions are different. This is the TRA secretion system. I think it's the, uh, I'm not sure, I think it's a type two secretion system. And then also the uh, tesori region found here and also here. And using the same uh, technique of blast homology search, we found several uh, plasmids that are a bit similar. But if you notice, the similarity is mostly here and here in the uh, transfer, in the transfer regions. Again, the mob analysis, and then these parts are similar, these parts are similar, and these other parts are just another mosaic of uh, different parts from different bacteria. And then the network analysis again, it's similar to <coughs> several more plasmids, and, uh, <coughs> and again, similar to several group of plasmids that are just being exchanged around. Now, here's the more important part. This plasmid, which is here, is uh, it's a novel, it's a novel plasmid in the INC P uh, incompatibility group. It's most closely related to probably this one, the methylophaga. Okay. This is a fish pathogen. This closely, most closely related plasmids were isolated from wastewater treatment plants. 
And this, this one is wastewater treatment plants within in the US. This one was isolated from Japan. And if you look at the other closely related species, this one is from soil. This one is from human. This one is from soil, from human, wastewater treatment plants, soil, soil, human, and soil. Now this INCP plasmid is, uh, is known to be a very uh, uh, the promiscuous, is the term. It's, a very, it's known to be a very promiscuous plasmid and can transfer easily to other bacteria. And as you can see here, it seems to be the, uh, a uh, major uh, vector of transfer from soil pathogens to human pathogens to fish pathogens to marine, to marine bacteria. It seems to be one, the one that's you know, changing all of this. Now, we wanted to see the relationship of this plasmid, PP9014, the new plasmid that we have, with other plasmids that were known from photobacteria. Now, this PP9014, we showed this earlier. It is closely related to our PR148, the plasmid that is very closely related to human pathogens. It's uh, one of the close related plasmids. This also, this one uh, isolated from Japan, this one isolated from the US. The interesting thing about these two plasmids is they're almost 100 completely, 100% the same. Okay? There's only a very short region where, in, especially in the accessory region, where they're different. So this is from, from uh, across the sea, if you think about it, from Japan, from Asia, to the US. How is this disseminated? Now, just to look at the difference in distribution of these two plasmids, this plasmid, INCP plasmid, which is supposed to be uh, promiscuous, while INCAC isn't known to be promiscuous, but if you notice, it's, uh, it was human pathogens, mostly um, animals, and some fish pathogens. This is in Japan. This probe uh, was designed uh, for colony hydrolysis for the PP9018, the, uh, the plasmid that looks like our earlier plasmid. This probe is for the new plasmid that is supposed to be promiscuous. Well, this older plasmid, the, the previous one, they're similar. There's so many that are similar to it. This, uh, when it's red and circled, it means this was positive. This were not detected. So again, in Japan, different years, different regions. Okay, this is different uh, very, uh, faraway regions. And still, this one was commonly found. This one wasn't. And then this one, older, older stock. This, uh, this stock was, uh, was kept in E. e coli. It was transferred and then later to detect the plasmid, uh, the type of the plasmid only. So again, this is more commonly found. Only here, only the current, the current one, the current plasmid that we report is positive for INCP. This is actually different than what we expected because we expected the, uh, that, the, that the newer plasmid as I said, it's because it's supposed to be promiscuous. It would be found more often, but it's not the case. The older type of plasmid was found more. So we're thinking that this new plasmid that we have, the INCP plasmid, is a vector only for transferring, but for disseminating and and uh, to you know, for the rest of the of the bacteria. The other plasmid, the older one, is the one that's doing it. Okay. This one, uh, the, the newer one, is only transferring from, from environments, okay, from the soil to the water, like that. And then the other one, the, the older plasmid that we have, and I, the, 
the 9901 ape like. That's the one that really disseminates it into this its present environment. Of course, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, <coughs> this PP901 like plasmid is, uh, if you notice, it's found in Enterobacteria CA, mostly Enterobacteria. And uh, <coughs> one of the things that we were thinking about is <coughs> if you look at here, humans and fish. We wanted to study, or at least my, my former professor, he wanted to study if there are similar plasmids in, in the workers in the fish farm, in the aquaculture farms, and in the fish. But unfortunately, he, he proposed that, but no one wanted, none of the workers wanted to, to cooperate with that kind of a study. So that, of course, that would be interesting, but that didn't go through. Another thing that uh, we could think of is, okay, you like tilapia? Okay. This is a this is old. This is an old uh, plasmid. So in Thailand, okay, people do their thing into the fish pond. Why? Because that is going to cause algae to grow. Okay. And with algae, it's food for the tilapia. So that's one, possibly one reason of the transfer. <coughs> From the human gut down there, <coughs> and the fish is. I hope it's different now. So you look at your tilapia, <laughs> look where it came from. Okay, so basically that's it. And, uh, I just want to thank all of you again for your attention. Thank you for coming here despite this weather. <coughs> and I just want to thank my co-authors. There's several, several of them from, from Korea, from Japan, and from Thailand. <coughs> thank you. gene, another gene, and it does transfer, okay? So, in a way, it doesn't matter the order. But, for example, if you take uh, an MGE, a plasmid, that's in the order A, B, C, okay? And then another plasmid that's A, B, F, A, C, B. They could not have been the same. The transferring would have happened somewhere else. Okay, uh, I'll explain it more. Okay, let's show. <coughs> okay. If you look at this slide, there's a drug resistant filter. Maybe this one would be better. Would be better. Ah, okay, this, this is good enough. There's a tetracycline resistance gene here. Okay. There is another tetracycline resistance gene here. They're exactly the same gene, but they're in a completely different position. So the event that would have caused this insertion would have been different. 
So that, uh, that this method will not be able to detect that. Could it be just the event, but the same process? Different yeah, the process would probably be the same, would be the same. But the purpose of this is to look at the similarity. So this insertion events, they happen. And then if, for example, here we insert something, and it gets carried over to its uh, future generations, then that should be more similar than an insertion that happens somewhere else. But this, this uh, technique, this approach to uh, quantifying does not take that into consideration. Sorry, it's, not, it's very difficult to <laughs> explain it without writing it down. Yes? Well, you cannot say that really it's contaminating because uh, that's an accepted part. It, when it's there, then it it just it becomes a fertilizer, and then when it's being exported already, it's it's already it's already clean. It's it's not there anymore. try to detect the presence or absence of, of this plastic in the imported and export of any food items. Um, so the, this idea of uh, lateral and horizontal transfer is kind of, you know, potential of it is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. And um, so from what I've seen, it, it involves bacteria and also uh, virus particles. Yeah. Are there other types of organisms where this is possible? Um, I mean, I'm assuming it must, it's gotta be on a microbial level. And um, how often does it happen, even within the, the bacteria and viruses, how often does it happen across species as opposed to within species? Do you have any idea of that? Um, I think I've not come across any uh, study that, that really uh, trying to quantify the, the, the amount of incidence or the uh, degree of incidence. That would be an interesting study, I think. Uh, but just consider this. To, in order to study the, the, uh, the plasmid that we have, we had to transfer it from the photobacterium or the aeromonas into E. coli. How do you do that? You just put the two bacteria together, let it grow for a couple of, for a day, it's very easy to be done. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we're also asking about the... Uh, Besides bacteria and viruses, is, it, is there evidence of this type of, you know, maybe not the same exact mechanisms, but that horizontal zoom uh, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, okay, maybe it's, it's a little bit different if, from what you're asking. There was recently a report that uh, these mobile genetic elements, okay, these are the ones that are being transferred, right? There have been reports that bats contain them. Okay. But again, maybe in that case also, it was a virus that caused the transfer. So from what I know, the, these plasmids and the, the viruses, they are the, the main catalysts of this transfer. Because, you know, naked DNA cannot exist too long. In the, in, the, in the water or in the environment. So from what I know, it's mostly fire, uh, plasmids and viruses that are the actuators of the transfer. In truth, the environment. But inside, there's again that, that transformation that I explained before. That the, uh, the, the, the sequence can detach itself and reattach. Did I satisfy your question? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking about things like uh, you know fungus or other protists. Yeah, but not from maybe there also it would be uh, like the 
virus and the bacteria would, would facilitate the transfer. Yeah. Right yeah. Maybe there also could be the virus. The <coughs> only good thing that I could say about that is this antibiotic resistance. Having an antibiotic resistance gene is, uh, is not advantageous normally. So in normal conditions, when antibiotics are not introduced into the environment, those bacteria that have antibiotic resistance genes, especially those that have a lot more antibiotic resistance genes, they will not be the dominant. They will not be the dominant strain because it costs it, it costs uh, uh, this. Uh, it costs some energy. So, if we stop using antibiotics indiscriminately, then we would be able to control. But if we don't, you know, what's not? Any more questions? Uh, if, you, if you want to uh, join Chris for lunch.